Hi there. Thanks for joining us yet again on yet another episode of the yet to be heard Space Nuts. Uh, my name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and it's good to have your company. Uh, coming up on this episode, uh, we talked about it before. It was rebuked, debunked, and the door was shut on it, and that was life in the atmosphere of Venus. And we only spoke about it the other day, and yet again, it has made the news. Uh, we will tell you all about it. Uh, we're also going to look at uh, some movement on the issue of space debris. You might remember there were a couple of incidents recently, recently with houses hit and people thumped and all sorts of because of space junk. Well, uh, it looks like they're going to literally move on that issue. And we're going to talk about a, uh, a man that uh, Fred has uh, worked with in the past, uh, a, a man who uh, had um, a, a wonderful astronomy career, uh, has uh, recently passed, but uh, a real advocate uh, for dark skies, David L. Crawford. That's all coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, Ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And making his moves in this episode will be Professor Fred Watson. Hello. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, you, everything in the universe moves, so I might as well move as well, which is yes. great. Good to see yes. you. <laughs> well, you too, you too. Uh, I just got back from Sydney. I didn't have time to rush over to your uh, side of the, the city. No. It was, would have taken way too long. Time. Hope you do some uh, Yeah, I would love to. But yeah. we were moving our son into a new apartment, and, um, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, he's very happy. It's a lovely place. It's in a very nice suburb it's it's off a main road in fact it's nowhere near a main road so it's it's really quiet um yeah he, he's done well i'm very proud of him and very uh, good. we both are and uh it all, all went well until i stubbed my toe on a concrete step and um i i just hit it at the perfect angle to cause mayhem and destruction so um ended up in uh, a doctor's surgery and had to have um Yes, the pressure relieved by uh, drilling a needle through the top of the, the nail. I don't recommend it. No. Did, no. Did, did you get any kind of local anesthetic for that? Or did they no. just cover it in? No, yeah. no he just, uh, we, we actually, it was funny because we were having a really long conversation while he was doing it. I think it was more for me to keep his mind off it than mine because uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't really care. Um, I've had so many needles stuck in me over my life. It didn't, well, I suppose you know, that's just, true. Yeah. Just another one. Uh, I must, I must say, he was very good. It didn't, um, didn't hurt at all. So, Excellent. But there was already a lot of pain there, so maybe it did. And yeah, I didn't notice, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it just completely, yeah, just have been the the perfect angle to cause the damage because I had I had shoes on, but um, still, um, yeah, I, I won't show it to you. You don't. No, nah. thank you. It's very kind of you. No. Uh, it's, it sounds it's, like a... it's that color. Oh, oh gosh, yes, I can yeah. imagine. Black Sounds and blue. like a, a freak accident, though, and uh, yeah. one that you could have done well done without, probably. Was that before it's, or after you uh, you moved all the furniture? Uh, it was in the middle of okay. all that. <laughs> we didn't have to move the big stuff, but lots and lots of boxes full of you know bits and pieces. So it was very difficult. But anyway, it's done. He's happy. We're all happy. I'm home and on the mend. Um, I hope you haven't had any incidents no, of no. So, so far. So far, it's all been smooth sailing, and let's hope it continues that way. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right, we better get down to business now. Uh, we did only a week or two ago talk about this um, supposed discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, which the discoverers suggested could mean signs of life, but then that was debunked. And it's sort of been going backwards and forwards for the last, uh, as it turns out, four years, four years since that discovery. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And now it's back to theory number one because the people who made that discovery have um, gone back uh, to their original concept with uh, a new sort of element to add to the argument. So they're again saying it is phosphine and we, you know, we, we are going to stand by this discovery. 
That's correct. And um, I think that uh, this one, this time it might stink, Andrew. I think it might mm. be uh, one that is a much harder to refute uh, by the, not the naysayers, just the sceptics, the people who, as we all do in the world of science, think, well, is that really correct? Uh, so, yes, that discovery made back in 2020 Um the same team, basically, uh, and that, actually that team includes a, a really good friend of mine on the island of Hawaii in Hilo. Uh, that, uh, uh, the, the, and in fact, that's where the telescope is, and that's why it's there. Um, the telescope is called the, Gla the James Clark Maxwell Telescope. It's uh, not at Hilo. It's on the summit of Mauna Kea, which is the mountain uh, that really makes up along with Mauna Loa, the, uh, the, the bulk of uh, the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, as you know, one of the um, best observing sites in the world for Northern yeah. Hemisphere astronomy. Um, uh, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope itself, quite a well-established and old facility. And unlike some of the other ones, which are sit right on top of the mountain, uh, where you can see them from all over the island, and that causes all kinds of grief, which is quite understandable, uh, the JCMT is nestled in a in a valley on top of the summit. There are valleys up there. It's quite an interesting geography. Uh, and that's to keep it away from terrestrial microwave radiation, because the James Clark, Clark Maxwell Telescope is a microwave telescope. So once again, this team has uh, pointed their telescope uh, at the planet Venus, but this time they have um, a new receiver on the telescope. And that apparently is the game changer in this uh, work. Uh, it's certainly giving them a good deal more confidence in the results that are coming out of it uh, and much more of the data themselves. Uh, so um, basically, uh, and the, the bottom line is that um, in each of the three observing campaigns they've, they've done with the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, they've got 140 times more data than they did with the original detection. So that's why they are uh, much more confident in their results. Uh, uh, this is a quote from uh, Dave Clements, who's a reader in astrophysics at Imperial College in London and uh, one of the one of the team members. Uh, we um, what we've got so far indicates that we once again have phosphine detections, uh, and so that's you know it's a bold thing to do to go back to your original target, knowing perhaps that you've got a better instrument uh, and have another look. And uh, it looks as though they are much more confident. Uh, mm. But there's also, um, you know, it's, it's a, but wait, there's more story because there is more to this. Uh, there is another observing team, uh, which is uh, working on a different part of the microwave spectrum. And they think they've detected uh, the gas ammonia. Uh, and that apparently is um, is, is it basically uh, you know a, a bigger an even bigger puzzle. So quoting Dave Clements again, <clears throat> he said that is arguably more significant than the discovery of phosphine. We're a long way from saying this. But he's saying it anyway. <laughs> We're a long way from saying this. But if there is life on Venus producing phosphine, we have no idea why it's producing it. However, if there is life on Venus producing ammonia, we do have an idea why it might want to breathe ammonia. Uh -huh. uh, and that is uh, the interesting part of this. And just to elaborate again on another comment from Dave Clements. Phosphine has been discovered in the atmosphere of Saturn, but that's not unexpected because Saturn is a gas giant uh, and there's an awful lot of hydrogen in its atmosphere. So any hydrogen-based compounds like phosphine or ammonia are what dominate there. Uh, but the, the, the same is not true of rocky planets uh, like our own and uh, Venus and Mars. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, the possible detection of uh, these hydrogen-based compounds, phosphine and ammonia, are so unexpected on Venus. Mm. Well, it, it does open up a can of worms, and it could be worms, I'm not sure, but um, uh, what, what are the odds of it being life? I know they say they're a long way from saying it is, but 
it could be, or you know, what? What? Else, well, I suppose the alternative question: what else could be causing the yeah. existence of phosphine and ammonia? That's that's the right way to look at it. Um, the the well, I'm, he's very, you know, Dave Clements is um, he's certainly talking the talk and giving us some very good uh, quotes here. Phosphine and ammonia have both been suggested as biomarkers. Mm -hmm. uh, including on exoplanets. So finding them in the atmosphere of Venus is interesting on that basis as well. When we published the phosphine findings in 2020, quite understandably, that was a surprise. Um, and so he makes the point that uh, other instruments have not actually made that detection. And they include... Uh, the v Venus Express spacecraft, which is uh, a, an ESA spacecraft in orbit around Venus. They include uh, a, a, something called the IRTF, uh, which is a NASA facility, again on Hawaii, not actually very far from the uh, James Clark Maxwell Telescope, NASA Infrared Telescope facility. Uh, and observations made uh, with a, actually a, a, an observatory that another of my friends has worked on, uh, SOFIA, which was the airborne NASA observatory on that uh, 7, 747SP, the yeah. hole in the back of it, uh, that's now no longer flying. Uh, but that, uh, when it was, and, and also obviously observed Venus, and they didn't find these phosphine found findings. So there's a number of different uh, uh, in investigations that have not turned up uh, the uh, the gas phosphine. Uh, and I am getting to the answer to your question in a minute, Andrew. I'm working round to it. Um, and there, but they've they've ruled out. One of the things that was suggested as being a contaminant uh, when that first lot of phosphine observations were released, and that was sulfur dioxide. Uh, and that um, is basically ruled out now by uh, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, uh, ALMA. But the key thing here, and again, I'm going to quote uh, Dave Clements, it turns out that all our observations that detected phosphine were taken as the atmosphere of Venus moved from night into day. And all the observations that didn't find phosphine were taken as the atmosphere moved from day to night. Oh. Um, and the suggestion is that uh, the ultraviolet light from the sun actually breaks up these molecules as it, as it moves from, uh, from, um, from, from day to night. Um, so... You know, if you take them at the end of the day, the molecules have all gone uh, because the sun's basically baked it out, as Dave Clements puts it. All phosphine is baked out, and that's why you don't see it. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So um, that suggests that the phosphine observations might be real and they might be um, sort of being replenished, if I can put it that way, because if you've got phosphine that at the end of the day isn't there uh, it's been baked out but at the beginning of the day it is there um, it suggests that something is forming phosphine and maybe mm. that is an indicator of life yeah you've got to wonder what kind of life that could be and it, it would be residing in the upper atmosphere because it's too hot for anything down on the planet that's correct and uh, there's nasty things as well there's all the sulfuric acid at lower levels in the um you know, down in the in the in the uh, droplets cloud, the sorry, the clouds of Venus further down. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, look, it's the suggesting what they're suggesting, and this now is a quote from uh, uh, actually once again from Dave Clements. I thought we're going to get another voice, but <laughs> um, um, ammonia. Uh, Actually, let me let me quote Jade Gra Graves or Greaves is professor of astronomy at Cardiff University, and actually I think she's the leader of the uh, of the team. Uh, she says the exciting thing behind this will be if it's some kind of microbial life making the ammonia, because that will be a neat way for it to regulate its own environment. Uh, it's really interesting that they you know that they are so confident with these observations. They're actually trying to look at what mechanisms living organisms might might be using uh, to create the phosphine or the ammonia. So I think they'd put it at 50-50. I'm just reading yeah. between the lines here. Myself, I'd put it lower. I think that maybe, you know, it's 
we've marked up this tree so many times, Andrew, uh, looking for um, rock solid biomarkers, and they're very, very difficult to find. Even mm. if you find something that you think is only caused by living organisms, there's probably always going to be another chemical way, uh, purely chemical way that you might form it, and that might not have been found yet. Right. So it could just be some kind of chemical reaction you need yeah. to Venus. Maybe so. Caused by okay. just the unusual conditions in the upper atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they certainly are unusual. Although we're really working hard to get there ourselves, aren't we? It's, um, <laughs> yes. Um, it's a great story. Uh, hopefully they're right about the phosphine and the ammonia. And hopefully, uh, and they're not absolutely saying that it's caused by life, but uh, you know, let's hope it's true. It would be wonderful to discover life beyond Earth as we, and, you know, and our focus is on Mars and Enceladus and, um, you know, ice moons in general, but Venus, Venus certainly sounds like it's a candidate worthy of further investigation. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley here with Profe uh, Professor Fred Watson <laughs> there. <laughs> Space Nuts. Uh, now to uh, another uh, thing in astronomy and space science that keeps popping up in the news, that of space debris. And there's been plenty of uh, debris hitting the ground in recent times and uh, it's, it's starting to become a real concern. There have been incidents around Florida. There's been incidents in Australia. Um, it's, it's, it's happening in several places. Um we and and this is because we're seeing so very many launches around the world, and Florida has been a bit of a hotbed of uh, of uh, space launches in recent times. But that uh, that incident we talked about a few weeks ago has um, I, it sounds like it's sort of become the straw that's broken the camel's back in mm. in certain respects, Fred. I think that's correct. Yes, the the, the uh, bit of debris that came through somebody's roof in Florida um, mm. because. Uh, no space launch organization wants to be responsible for something coming back and injuring or killing somebody. Now, that's not happened yeah. yet, but uh, they're worried that it, that it will. Uh, and, but this is a little bit more specific than just the very large numbers of spacecraft that are being launched. It's to do entirely with the Dragon space uh, capsules, which are a product of SpaceX, uh, they are flown on uh, SpaceX rockets, they're Falcon 9 rockets. Uh, and the Dragon capsules come in two flavors. Uh, one is Crew Dragon, which has humans on board, and the other is the Dragon, which doesn't, uh, which is a cargo spacecraft. Um, so th there, there are two different kinds, and they've both, um, they've been significant numbers of both, actually, uh, which have flown. In fact, if I can i'll find it uh there have been uh i can't remember how many how many of the um uh crew dragon missions have been uh um several but there have been more than 20 <laughs> 20 of the of the cargo dragon missions so you see you know we 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 make the Crew Dragon missions tend to make big news because they're carrying yeah, astronauts. Yeah. The Cargo Dragon ones don't, and there are far more of them. Uh, they're the ones that dock remotely with or um, autonomously with the International Space Station, and sure enough, they unload cargo. Uh, and um, that's great. So so the Dragons, um, there are more of them than we tend to hear about, is what, what I'm getting at. Uh, but um, both of them, both the Crew Dragon and the Cargo Dragon capsules, have... Uh, what is called the trunk, um, and that is uh, a, a, it's basically it, it's what we used to call the service module in the Apollo era, and in fact, I think Boeing still call it the service module for their uh, Starliner spacecraft. Uh, but the, uh, the 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 trunk uh, component, so it's a cylindrical uh, space vehicle. Uh, which uh, sits between the capsule itself, carrying either crew or cargo, and the launch vehicle. Um, and I think it probably is the second stage of the launch vehicle that it sits on top of. Uh, so that tr trunk is the bit that is the culprit here, because it's bits of those trunk trunks uh, that have fallen in 
various different places, including Australia, not very far from Canberra, including the one that went through the roof in Florida, including yeah. North Carolina and Saskatchewan in Canada. All of these places have had bits of uh, SpaceX car, uh, Dragon trunks falling on them. And so uh, SpaceX have gone back to the drawing board uh, to look at why this is happening uh, and to try and understand how it can be prevented. Uh, and uh, there are two things, I think, that have changed. Uh, one is that they have changed the landings of the, uh, the, the Dragon spacecraft um, from the east coast uh, of Florida to the west coast uh, of the United States. Uh, so that they they will start landing the the dragon capsules themselves in the Pacific rather than the Atlantic. In fact, they're basing their operations uh, out of Long Beach, uh, California, for mm. their um, the, you know what's called post flight processing. In other words, going and recovering the uh, the dragon capsules, and then they will be transported across country back to Florida for the next launch. Uh, so that's one thing that they've done. And the other is that they... That, that's a big thing, though. That, that's not going to be a cheap move. Huge, that's right. And it's going to cost them because they're not mm. just pulling these things uh, out of the water uh, right next door to where they're going to launch it the next time. Um, it's, got to, it's got to go across country. So, yes, it will cost them. Uh, but the other thing is that they'll shift um, the time that the... Uh, the re-entry burn uh, starts because I think, if I'm remembering this correctly, uh, 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 the situation has been that they have separated the crew dragon capsule from the trunk before they have fired the trunk burn uh, to bring it back. And I think they're going to do that afterwards now. I hope I've got that the right way around. Uh, but the, the bottom line, you know, yeah, we're not flying the spacecrafts, so it doesn't really matter. But it's 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 a change in the way that they will actually initiate the re-entry of the of the trunk. Uh, and the hope there is that they will that it will achieve high enough velocities to burn up completely. But if it doesn't, it will fall in a much more safe zone. It's much likely likelier to fall over ocean than over land. That's the bottom line. Right. Well, um, it, it's good that they've taken notice of the problem and they're making moves to reduce the potential impact. So that'll come as a relief to a lot of people and probably insurance companies too. I mean, <laughs> it sounds funny, but they've been talking about it um, becoming a, a thing for, for homeowners and business owners in certain parts of the world that, that have a lot of these uh, potential problems. Um, and it, yeah, that could jack up premiums and uh, it, it also uh, reduces the risk to human life, which is the most important thing. So uh, it does sound like they're making some positive moves, Fred. Yes, that's right. I, I think it's a, it's a good outcome. And uh, well, let's see what happens. Let's see Indeed. how it goes. Yeah. Yes. If you'd like to read up on that story, it's available on phys, P -H -Y -S dot org. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. One more thing before we wrap it up, Fred, and a little bit of sad news. Uh, David Crawford, David L. Crawford, passed away uh, just uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks at the age of 93. This is a, a fellow who uh, has worked for, a, had a very long and wonderful career in astronomy, and I believe you've um, crossed paths with uh, David in your career as well. well. Yes, indeed, that's right. So um, actually, uh, there's a very nice uh, tribute to David Crawford on the Sky and Telescope website. Uh, just the first paragraph of that t says it all. With the peaceful passing of David L. Crawford on July the 22nd, at the age of 93, we've lost the person who taught the world about light pollution and warned us all of the threat it poses, not just to astronomy, but to the entire nocturnal environment. Um, so uh, he, he basically spent time um, at major observatories uh, in the United States. He was an astronomer, exactly as you've said. He got his doctorate from the University of Chicago, uh, spent time at Yerkes Observatory, um, and uh, 
uh, basically wound up in Tucson, Arizona, at the Kitt Peak National Observatory, which which is the equivalent of Siding Spring in the United States, Andrew, oh, okay. to put it in context of, uh, of our national observatory here uh, in northwestern New South Wales. Kitt Peak, uh, not very far from Tucson. Uh, and um, basically he was really interested in uh, the structure of and evolution of star clusters and galaxies. Absolutely uh, you know, front rank uh, uh, astronomy problems back in 1960 when he joined the staff at Kitt Peak. Um, and in fact, he basically morphed from that those studies into the, uh, the two great four-meter telescopes that were being uh, built in the 1960s. Uh, and early 70s. Um, and in fact, our Anglo-Australian telescope, which was commissioned exactly 50 years ago, uh, 1974, uh, that telescope was a copy uh, of, uh, at some level, a copy, an over, a general copy in design of the two four metres that uh, Dave Crawford was responsible for. Uh, one at Kitt Peak, that's called the Mail Telescope, and the other at the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile, which is down not far, far from La Serena, if I remember rightly. Um, so these uh, these two big telescopes focused his mind and attention on what could stop observatories. And he very quickly realised that 100 kilometres from Kitt Peak, uh, there was Tucson with half a million people at that time, okay. uh, and that it was a city that was getting brighter and brighter and that was a threat to the environment of the telescopes. Uh, but he um, basically uh, went on a mission to encourage the city to think about this, uh, and they very quickly enacted uh, legislation uh, to protect the darkness of Kitt Peak, and that's where it all started. Um, right. So uh, along with a gentleman called Tim Hunter, uh, who was an amateur astronomer who'd also been concerned with that. Uh, so that was the start of the dark sky movement uh, in the world and in the, during the 1980s in particular. Now, I met Dave uh, when he came here for a dark sky conference to Australia. It would have been probably 20 years ago. Um, um, I met him through uh, a, another really good friend, a colleague, sadly, who also is no longer with us, Reg Wilson. He was Mr. Dark Skies in Australia. He used to carry around with him uh, a newspaper cutting from 1973, which said, now it's light pollution. Uh, and it was quoting him, uh, uh, you know, uh, who uh, having, having worked with Dave Crawford knew what light pollution was all about and that it was not just bad for astronomers, but bad in general. Uh, yeah, and, well, and, yes, it is because it's it's bad for human health exposure yeah. to light. We need darkness to get a decent night's sleep. Basically, that's correct. So. That's absolutely right. So mm. you, you, it's all about circadian rhythms. And uh, yep. I've had my other half, Marnie, as you know, she's talked about this on Space Notes. She's uh, uh, getting to be a world authority on this uh, as we speak. In fact, she's doing a lot of radio interviews because National Science Week here in Australia uh, next week, as we speak today, that will feature dark. Uh, light pollution as its uh, as its focus, uh, so uh, it's it's become much more widely understood than it was before. We now know as well that nocturnal animals and even some uh, you know non nocturnal species uh, are badly affected by light pollution. So we know much more about it. The International Dark Sky Association was formed in 1988, um, and uh, actually there's a, qu a quote from. Uh, uh, from the 1988 May 1988 issue of Sky and Telescope uh, that reported on that uh, formation. Uh, it's now called Dark Sky International, but it was then the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, Dave Crawford, Crawford said, lack of awareness rather than resistance to change is generally the biggest problem in controlling light pollution. And I think that remains the case today. I think it's just people are, are ignorant of what, what it's all about. Yes, yes, and they need to be educated. And the uh, the the torch continues to be held by uh, your good wife Marnie and and many other people around the world. But it all started with uh, this great man and yep, David. Uh, yeah, uh, David L. Crawford, uh, who has uh, passed away. Uh, Fred, we're going to end on that note. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure, Andrew, and uh, we'll talk again soon. I hope. Yeah, like 
Could be a few minutes. Yeah, that's it. Has that joke run out of puff yet? I don't no. know, but um, <laughs> that's you keep I... telling it. <laughs> I didn't think it was a joke. I just thought it was what we What's do next. <laughs> it's absolute reality, yes. All right, uh, Fred, we'll see you soon. And yeah. uh, don't forget, by the way, uh, if you are um, on social media, you can watch us on YouTube and don't forget to subscribe. You can talk to other Space Nuts listeners via our uh, Space Nuts podcast group Facebook page or our other Facebook page, which is the genuine article. But, um, yeah, they both get plenty of traffic. Uh, we're on Instagram. We're everywhere. And we'll be back here uh, very, very soon with another episode. Oh, and thanks to Hugh in the studio for reasons I'm still to glean. But uh, thank you, Hugh. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. See you on the next episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.